My wife has often said, I have the best job in the world. Uh, she says this when she's usually sitting next to me at very good plays. Uh, <laughs> she does not say it on those nights when there is a blizzard and I have had to take a streetcar to the western end of the city to see something that's appalling with four other people. But one of the times she said this, and in fact, the night she said the line, don't ever give up this job, we were sitting in a theater in New York watching our special guest tonight. It was a very special occasion. It was a production of Long Day's Journey Into Night in which he starred with Vanessa Redgrave, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and Robert Sean Leonard. It was totally amazing. Some of you obviously saw it. But to me, it was kind of like the capper in a long time of watching a great actor. His Willie Loman had been superb, his Huey. He had done all kinds of parts that I cherished having seen in Chicago and in New York, and on screen and on television. I was fortunate enough, shortly after that, to get to meet him when he came to the Stratford Festival and did his incredible double bill of Huey and Crap's Last Tape. And he was also then doing All's Well That Ends Well. Um, we've got to know each other further. I blush to tell you that one night about two years ago, he and I and the estimable director Jennifer Tarver closed a blues club in the south side of Chicago. And luckily, there are no YouTube videos of that evening. <laughs> but. This is a man who has great talent, he has great charm, great charisma, and a heck of a lot of good stories, which I hope we'll share with you now. Would you welcome our very special guest, Mr. Brian Dennehy. Thank you. What do you want to say? Am I there okay? Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> I hope you're all readers. <laughs> Brian, um, going, going back to the beginning, some of the, the best things I've ever heard from you were talking about your dad. You want to start out with him? Well, my father, I was, uh, uh, I was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut, but I was raised in uh, Brooklyn and New York, and ultimately on Long Island. Is this too loud? Okay, I'm just getting a feedback here. Uh, and my dad was, uh, worked for the Associated Press and was a closet Irish intellectual, uh, of which there are many. Sometimes they're in the pub uh, rather than the closet, but uh, in fact, quite a few times. But, uh, and he got me turned on to reading, and it's interesting to be, to be talking here tonight in the library. I used to, uh, as early as eight years old, nine years old, I would be at the... Uh, one of the branches of the Brooklyn Public Library, the Queens Public Library, always on Thursday, and I would always take 10 books, because that's all they would let me take. <laughs> all of which I would have read by the weekend. Uh, these were not all, we're not talking about incredibly complicated books, but, they, but I had a tremendous appetite for reading, given to me by my father, and I still have it. And I'm grateful, um, also, not a Kindle owner. Uh, I like to read. <laughs> I like to, uh, uh, Scott Turo is a friend of mine. And Scott came out with a, a recent book, I can't remember, I think it was called, not Verdict, Innocent, or I can't remember. But it's a great book, it's a great book about the law, and he's a wonderful writer. And he noticed me carrying, I was in Chicago, he noticed me carrying a shopping bag full of books, he says, Who'd you buy? I said, they're all your book. book. I give them as presents. And people, even today, including my daughters, who are Kindle users, get furious when they say, why do you buy all these books? All you have to do is give somebody a gift card or something. I said, you don't understand. It's a book. It's something you can hold. You can read it. And I can't believe that the, that the writers are not getting more money for the book than they are for that piece of electronic, whatever the hell it is, that goes through the wires. <laughs> anyway, the point is that I, I'm not going to change, you know, and my father never changed, but reading and writing and literacy and, uh, was important to me from an early age and given to me by, by my dad. It's interesting. Your dad was, had a choice at one point when he came back from World War II 
a lot of the people he hung out with, you can mention, went on to go into the medium of TV, of radio and television. Right. They wanted him to join, but he stayed faithful to print. Well, the funny thing is probably very similar to me with the Kindle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I did a, a, a picture one night. It wasn't actually, it was a live telegraph. Some of you may remember this. George Clooney somehow got Warner Brothers to agree to put on a live telecast maybe 10 years ago of a thing called Red Alert. And they had all these sound stages, and, and it was a, a three-hour movie about a, an invasion, a possible old-style nuclear invasion of uh, New York with a whole bunch of actors. And um, I remember uh, the, the British director, whose name I can't think of right now, said to me, why are we doing this? <laughs> why can't we put it on tape and rehearse and everything? Anyway, we did it live. Walter Cronkite was there. And uh, Cronkite, Cronkite came over to me and he said, was your father Ed Denny? And I said, yes, he was. He said, he was an amazing newspaper man, a wonderful, he went on and on about my father, knowing my father in London. And uh, he, he said to me, what do you think about all this, what we were doing there that night? And I said, well, my father would have hated it. My father loved books and he loved movies and but, uh, you know, the whole idea of doing something de deliberately that didn didn't have to be done in, a, in that way. Now, r making a newspaper was a, not only important, it was an absolutely vital thing. Richard will remember the old rolls, rolls of yellow paper that would come off the uh, teletype machines, and they would rip them across, and... My father would bring home these pencils, which were made with cardboard. Remember the cardboard wrapped around the lead, and then you would pull a string? And uh, he would do his work with that. And I remember walking into 50 Rock, which is where the uh, AP head, general headquarters was, fourth floor. And when the elevator doors opened on the floor, you, you could hear this racket, this noise unbelievable noise of people shouting, hundreds of people shouting, machines, teletype machines, tele old typewriters, a room twice as large as this, filled with desks and people running around, teletype machines along the wall, typewriters on these desks, these battered desks, and people howling at each other. And in that, in that chaos, these people were writing and thinking and on telephones, and talking across the world, and so on and so forth. That's the way it used to be. And he never wanted it to change. Well, obviously, it does. I went back years later to talk to the AP editorial board. And when the elevator doors opened, and I could hear nothing, <laughs> <clears throat> went into the room, and the room was filled with people, but all you could hear was the click. <laughs> and there were hushed tones. I said, well, that? Are all changed now. But uh, in any case, he was, uh, he, he gave me a, um, a gift that you, you never can understand the value of, which is to appreciate the word, the written word, the thought behind the word, and the person who was behind all of it. And so writers and thinkers have always been extremely important to me. Now, as an actor today, doing Shakespeare and uh, Pinter, it's more true now and at, at the age of 73 than it ever was before. But it's all about the written word and the thought behind the written word and the person who's doing the thinking. What, what brought you to the place where you started getting into theater? I mean, you're an Irish Catholic boy, big hearty type, going to Catholic boys high school. What, what got you into this? I was a football player and a kind of a show-off. <coughs> I, I know it's hard to believe, but I was. <laughs> and uh, I, I was a clown on the football field as I was any place else. I had a wonderful a teacher named Chris Sweeney, who's still alive. And uh, in those days, in 1952 or 53, if you were a Catholic high school lay teacher in Brooklyn, you might be lucky if you made 50 bucks a week. And for 50 bucks a week, he did everything. He was a coach, he was an English teacher, a wonderful English teacher. Um, 
And he decided in his spare time that he would start a drama club, <laughs> which he did. And uh, the first play that he decided to do was Macbeth. And he decided that I should play the king, Macbeth. I was 14. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the audience were 400 Irish Catholic schoolboys <laughs> from Brooklyn. <laughs> For whom the most dramatic moment that they could possibly imagine was Jackie Robinson turning a double play at Ebbets Field. Okay? <laughs> Anything more complicated than that was hardly drama. In any case, uh, my friends in the business always say when I tell this story, my God, what guts, what guts to do Shakespeare, to do Macbeth in front of a group of uh, Catholic high school boys in Brooklyn in 1953. You were a brave, brave man, boy. I say, not nearly as brave as the freshman who played Lady Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> and he was very good at it, too. <laughs> Do we ever know what happened to him? Well, that's the funny story. There's, there is a button on the story, which I never anticipated. Years later, talking to Chris Sweeney, the guy who ran that club, um, and who started us all off, the kid's name was Marius Panzarella beautiful Italian boy, he was 13 or 14, and a wonderful husky voice, and he was a hell of a Lady Macbeth. <laughs> so I said to uh, Chris, I said, whatever happened to Maris? Are you in touch with Maris? He said, oh yeah. I said, so tell me, is he a hairdresser, a designer? <laughs> <laughs> he says, no, he's a, he's, a, uh, he's a hunting and fishing guide on Kodiak Island. <laughs> How's that for an act of compensation? Yeah. <laughs> no, he's a, just, a, just a real tough guy, you know, despite that beginning. But everything was different in those days. Yeah. So. Now, despite that, that promising start, you know, working up the top in one of Shakespeare's tragedies, did you, you didn't really go on right away into theater, did you? No. Well, we did some plays in high school. I went to Columbia, right? I got a football scholarship to Columbia, believe it or not. As bad as that football team was, they gave out scholarships. <laughs> and uh, uh, because uh, that would have been now 57, 58, which was the height of, or the beginning of the height of Kerouac and On the Road and Black Berets. And, uh, and the, I remember the, the, the theater group did uh, Marat Saad, which is <laughs> one of the most complicated plays you can imagine with huge numbers of actors. and. Uh, when I showed up to audition wearing my football zipper jacket, uh, I was made to feel not welcome. So I never did anything in there. And then after that, I was in the Marine Corps for uh, almost four years. And needless to say, there wasn't much dramatic activity in that, except for the PR involved in being in the Marine Corps. Uh, and, uh, and it was years later that uh, I was probably 25, 26, married, a couple of kids, and uh, for some reason, I just, I, I started making the rounds in New York. I, I did a couple of plays off, off Broadway, and at the age of 28, um, there was a little theater called, the, it was actually in an old subway warehouse. And the, the, the cut into the stone in front of this big, massive building were, were the initials of one of the uh, subways, IRT. And there was a group in there called the Impossible Ragtime Theater <laughs> because of the letters on the, which had nothing whatever to do with the subway, of course. And they did a production of Ivanov, Chekhov's first full length play. And essentially it was a vanity production built around this well known New York actor, whose name I won't mention. And uh, it was. For him, that the show was being done to, to strut his stuff as Ivanov and so forth. And I got the small part of, of uh, a Borkin, which was the classic Chekhovian Russian peasant, made famous later on with Lopakhin, and of course, in Cherry Orchard, which I also played later on. Anyway, long story short, I mean, I was working, I was driving a cab, I was driving a truck, I can't remember, maybe, I always had a job and uh, going to the theater. And I didn't even know it, but Mel Gusso, God bless him, who was the second chair critic for the New York Times, had come to see the production. 
and wrote this review. And in those, time, in those days, everybody read the Times. Everybody read the Times, and especially the theater section, whatever it was called in those days, the arts. No, except, of course, I didn't read the Times. <laughs> you know, I read the Daily News, or <laughs> maybe the Post. But anyway, I came in. We, we do the shows on the weekends, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. came in on Thursday, and I noticed that everybody was, and it was a big cast, everybody was distinctly cold to me, which was unusual. I mean, none of us were making any money. I mean, any money, no money. Uh, and we were all just kind of doing it for ourselves. And then eventually it became obvious to me that a review had been written in the New York Times in which I was prominently featured. And nobody else in the play was. And, uh, well, that's a, it sounds great, but believe me, when you've got to do another month or six weeks with a bunch of actors who are not happy with you, it's not so easy. But all of a sudden, everything changed. And uh, the phone started to ring, and I got an agent, and I started getting jobs. And uh, after that, it, you know, I, after 10, 12 years, I was an overnight success. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were telling me once that you had gotten to this level, and everything, you know, it was, it was nice, and you were getting work, but you needed to kick it up to that next level. And then uh, you finally got called in to read for that Trevor Griffiths play, and that, yeah. that, that was what kind of made you... Well, what, you know, I wasn't even... I, I was never even a, much of a believer in myself. In fact, it's still kind of a problem for me, although uh, to the world, I never seemed to lack confidence, but I kind of wondered a lot of the times what I was doing in this place, having these things happen. And uh, I came back, I was doing a tour of Skowhegan, Maine, and uh, Falmouth Playhouse and so forth in the summer. We had a week off in the middle of the summer, and I came back, and we did what all actors did in those days in New York, and I'm talking about the mid-'70s, I guess. Uh, you went to the Equity Lounge and hung out. There was an Equity Lounge and had all kinds of easy chairs and magazines and newspapers, and if you were an Equity member, you could essentially sit in there and the primary function of which was, was a place to go to the bathroom <laughs> in midtown Manhattan, which was nice. And I came in and I was sitting there and somebody came up to me and says, hey, there's a play that you should be auditioning for. And I said, really? And I had no agent, okay, at this point. And uh, yeah, it's called The Comedians uh, by Trevor Griffith. And it's, uh, it's about a bunch of British comics going to school in Manchester, I think. So I called somebody who had been, from time to time, my agent, and I said, you know, I can do an Irish accent. This was Northern Irish accent. And uh, so she said, well, go over to the equity auditions. Now, if you've never seen what an equity audition is, this is, what this means is that the producers or one of their representatives has to interview every equity member who <laughs> wants to interview, who wants to be considered for the part. Well, usually there are thousands of those, you know, all taking a shot. And I got on the end of this endless, I got on the end of this endless line, which is what she meant. Go over there and that kind of got me off the phone. Something <laughs> I, they didn't have to worry about me anymore. And literally after an hour of walking and you, and you could hear, I mean, it was really like all those bad movies. You know, there was, a, there was an assistant uh, director standing on stage with the script, reading the same sequence over and over again. The ghost light, the f famous ghost light, was on stage. This was a real theater, Broadway theater. And out in the audience, barely discernible, was an assistant casting director and a secretary who were, you know, so bored out of their minds. <laughs> you could hardly, because I was bored just listening to what was going on. Actor coming and saying, three or four lines, and I'm saying, okay, thanks very much, thanks, and going on. And w looking at, somebody handed me a bunch of the pages, and there were four or five different excerpts, one of which was a, a, a character named McBrain, who was a Northern Irish comedian, trying to be a comedian. 